ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last webinar, the 10th one, under the Distinguished Speaker webinar series on the field of special and inclusive education organized by the Department of Educational Studies of the University of Nicosia. The free webinar series took place online between September uh, 2021 and June 2022. They provide access to leading research and uh, academic minds all over the world in special and inclusive education and uh, a unique opportunity for all of us to learn more about new methodologies, ideas, and practices in this field. The webinars also provide the opportunity for the audience to interact creatively with uh, invited speakers through a synchronous open discussion taking place uh, through YouTube and uh, Facebook chat. Then we kindly ask you to try to use this opportunity to pose any related question you might have for receiving an appropriate answer from the today, today's speaker. Thus, if you have questions concerning aspects, aspects of autism with particular emphasis on mental health needs and uh, under cognition in uh, girls, females, during the speech, uh, please share them and uh, we will be able to address them at the end promoting thus a useful discussion between audience and the invited excellent today's speaker coming from the King's College London. Let me kindly remind that uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be made available in our website in a few days after the today's the today last webinar event. Now, I'd like to introduce today's invited speaker. Today, we have the great, greatest pleasure and opportunity to have with us an internationally renowned expert and rigorous long-running researcher in the field of autism, Professor Francesca Hape from the King's College in London to give us a speech on the following interesting and uh, contemporary topic, autism, thinking about mental health needs and under recognition in girls. Before, le before uh, hearing the speaker, let me kindly read a short bio of her. Francesca Hape is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at King's College London. Her research in the last 30 years focuses on autism. She has explored social understanding and uh, mentalizing difficulties in autism, as well as abilities and assets in relation to detailed focused cognitive style. Her recent work focuses on mental health and uh, under-recognized subgroups, including women and uh, the elderly. She is a fellow of the British Acad Academy and Academy of uh, Medical Science, past president of the International Society for Autism Research, and has received the Royal Society Rosalind Franklin Award British Psychological Society Spearman Mendel and the President's Award and a CB from the Queen for the excellent services to the study of uh, autism. Let me explain here that the CB which uh, Professor Francesca Hape received from the Queen means simply commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Among famous British people who have CB are Stephen Hawking, theoretical physicist, uh, physicist cosmo, cosmologist and author, and uh, Lucasian professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge. Helena Bonham Carter, English 
uh, actress as well as Harold Pinder, one of the most influential modern Brits, British dramatists, screenwriter, director, and actor, and Nobel Prize winning. Let me lastly point out that uh, Professor Francesca Hape, in cooperation with uh, Professor Sue Fletcher Watson, University of Edinburgh, have uh, recently, uh, 2019, written, among other books and uh, scientific articles, an excellent book with the title, Autism, a new introduction to psychological theory and current debate that I personally translated into Greek and it is in the process of editing in Greece. She will uh, show, among others, the cover of this book in one of her last slides of her today's speech. Now, let me give uh, the floor to Professor Francesca Hape and uh, we are uh, uh, waiting for listening uh, her speech. Thank you so much, Dimitris. And thank you for the kind invitation to talk in this prestigious seminar series. Um, I'm very pleased to tell you about some of our recent work. So I will just set the slides going and I hope that they show up fine for you. So I'm going to talk about autism. I'll talk about mental health and I'll talk about under recognition in women and girls. A brief overview of what I'll cover in the next 50 minutes or so. I want to just remind us that in autism, complexity is the norm. And I'll give a definition, of course, of autism. Then I'll talk about research on mental health. And I want to talk particularly about some new work that we've been doing about post-traumatic stress disorder and its links with autism. I want to reflect for a little bit on why mental health problems might be so common in autism. And then I'm going to think about camouflaging and diagnosis, and that will lead us to think about girls and under diagnosis. And I want to say a word about inclusive schools before I conclude. So autism is a neurodevelopmental condition. It affects around 1% of children and adults. It's a lifelong condition. And although it's strongly genetic, we don't have any gene or blood test for autism. The diagnosis is purely based on behavior and it's based on social and communication difficulties and rigid and repetitive interests and activities. The signs are present early in development, but diagnosis may come much later. And there's a generation who are coming for diagnosis in their 50s, 60s, 70s years old, um, because the diagnostic criteria have changed over time and become broader. There's a spectrum of manifestations. So this ranges from, say, an autistic four-year-old who might have no speech, um, who spends hours lining up toys as their way of playing, who doesn't go to his or her parents even when hurt or distressed and seems happiest alone, to an adult who may be very sociable, have very fluent language, although they still find it difficult to understand if somebody is teasing or joking or telling a white lie, um, who has maybe a very developed interest in astronomy, for example, that they can make their job, um, and who is rigid and repetitive in their preferences around, for example, what they eat. So a spectrum of manifestations. An important aspect of autism is to recognize that autism rarely occurs alone. About a third of autistic people will also have epilepsy. About a quarter, perhaps, also have intellectual disability. And sleep problems are very, very common. Sensory sensitivities are now part of the diagnostic criteria and anxiety and depression and ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, developmental coordination disorder are all very common, accompanying the core diagnostic criteria of social difficulties, communication difficulties, and rigid and repetitive behavior. Now, interestingly, it's only since 2013 and the DSM-5 that clinicians have really been allowed to give multiple diagnoses to somebody who is autistic. So now a child or adult can have a diagnosis of autism and anxiety. Before that, if you had autism, you weren't allowed to have any of these other diagnoses, which is clearly um, not practical and not reflecting what's happening in real life. So we know that mental health is poor for many autistic children and adults, 
around 70% of children and 80% of adults have at least one mental health condition. Very commonly, this is anxiety or depression. Um, and you can see uh, from the orange graphic that autistic adults are not satisfied with the health services that they get or the way that their mental health difficulties are treated. So high rates, as I've said, a lot of clinic studies have found high rates of these additional problems. And that may be because if you go to a clinic, you're more likely to be a more complex case. But population-based studies have also suggested high rates. So 70% at age 12 um, having at least one mental health problem and 40% having two additional problems. And you can see there that anxiety was most common, upset, uh, um, oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD. And these persisted from age 12 to age 16. And I want to tell you very briefly about a study that we've done, which is again population based. We took advantage of a very large twin study that looks at all the twins born in England and Wales in 1994, 95 and 96. And we found the families where at least one of the twins um, had an autistic diagnosis or was likely to be autistic based on their um, on checklists they filled in for us. And we used the strengths and difficulties questionnaire to ask about emotional symptoms, that's anxiety and depression, conduct problem scale, and also hyperactivity. So parents answered these questions and other questions too. And we found that 52% of the autistic children aged around 13 uh, met clinical criteria for emotional difficulties, 32%, sorry, 39% for emotional, 24% for conduct difficulties, and 33% for hyperactivity. And this was much more common than comparison non-autistic twins. It was also much more common than their co-twin if their co-twin was not autistic. So family environment held the same, but the rates of mental health very different. And you can see here that it was common to have more than one area of difficulty. So um, around 11% had all three levels of clinical difficulty, conduct, hyperactivity, and emotional problems. And in fact, solo problems, just conduct problems, was more uncommon than having it in combination with other difficulties. We've looked over time from age four, age seven, and age 13. And here you can see each line, each horizontal line is one child. And if they're in the green, they don't have any problems past clinical cutoff. And if they're orange, they have at least one problem of the sorts I've just shown you. So you can see in the comparison group, most of the lines, most of the children are green and stay green throughout the time period from age four to age 13. But in the autism group, more than half start off orange. They have at least one problem at age four and continue, most of those continue to have a problem through age 13. And some children have a new problem at age seven and most of those continue. So very few are green throughout. And this just shows you by the individual domains. So I also want to highlight that in the same study, we found out that it matters who you ask when you're finding out about mental health problems in teenagers. So this is work by Victoria Hallett, and she compared parent report on various um, anxiety questionnaires and self-report from the autistic or non-autistic 14-year-olds. And what you can see is in the uh, green bars, what we usually find in studies of non-autistic or general population adolescents. The self-report of anxiety problems is higher than the parent report. So these young people who are beginning to live independent lives are actually suffering more anxiety than their parents are aware of. But see in the blue bars, the autistic young people, and there the report from the parents is above the report from the children. So this just highlights that it really is important who the informant is. And we're not saying that either informant is wrong, but clearly there are some anxieties that parents are able to pick up in their children that the children either aren't aware of, or maybe the autistic children think that everybody lives with that level of anxiety, so they don't rate themselves especially highly. Mental health continues to be poor in autistic older adults. This is work by Ezra Zervali, who was a PhD student with me, and she compared young autistic adults around age 30 with old autistic adults around age 60. 
And in general, both groups had high levels of depression. Along the bottom, you can see the percentages. So more than 50% met criteria for depression. Um, and this is true also in older age. So there were few age differences. Um, and importantly, depression was the biggest predictor of quality of life in the autism sample, much more important than the level of your autistic symptoms. So I want to zoom in now on one particular mental health difficulty, which we think has been neglected in autism. And this is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we had the hypothesis that autistic people will have an increased risk of post-traumatic stress disorder for a number of reasons. And I want to give you an anecdote, which was one of the pieces of everyday experience that led us to this conclusion. So an autistic man that I know always takes the bus, always took the bus to work every day, the same bus from the same bus stop. And one day the bus took a detour, the road was closed and it had to go somewhere different. And so he got off the bus somewhere completely different, nowhere near his work and somewhere he didn't know where he was. And he really panicked and was really frightened. And after that, he didn't want to take that bus anymore. In fact, he didn't want to take any bus ever again. And when he walked past the bus stop where he usually took the bus, he would start to panic and re-experience the fear that he had. So this is an uh, example of somebody who maybe was traumatized by a fairly everyday experience. So we think that autistic people may be more vulnerable to post-traumatic stress disorder. Firstly, we know that autistic people are exposed to more traumatic events. They're more often stigmatized, attacked, bullied. We also, from the bus example, think that a wider range of life events will be experienced as traumatic if you're autistic. Autistic people often have particular perceptual and cognitive processing styles. They may be very detail focused, and this may predispose to PTSD. And also these coping strategies they use, avoidant coping may also make PTSD persist. So this, these are the results from a study that we did, Freya Rumble led. We, it was an online study where we invited autistic adults who felt they had been exposed to something they found traumatic. And we asked them um, various questions. So the bus example I just gave you is not considered in DSM-5 to be a traumatic event. To be a traumatic, to have experienced a trauma in DSM-5, you have to have experienced or witnessed death or threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury or threatened sexual violation. So the bus example wouldn't count. And that man, even if he's experiencing PTSD symptoms, would not get a DSM-5 diagnosis in America. So he wouldn't get treatment or help. So we were particularly interested to consider whether DSM-5 traumas and those unusual traumas like the bus example, whether they affect autistic people differently. So first I'm showing you the results from the people who reported a DSM-5 qualifying trauma. And you can see these include things like sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, and uh, serious injury to somebody that, that the person witnessed. Um, around 72% of our 59 autistic adults, around 72% of the females reported one of these traumas and around 48% of the males reported one of these DSM-5 traumas. And we asked them to fill in the PCL-5, which is a checklist of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And what we found was that 45% of these autistic adults reported current symptoms that passed the clinical threshold for PTSD. It's not a diagnosis, it's only a checklist. This is a study done online um, for various reasons, um, but it does suggest that their symptoms are at a clinical level. And this compares with around 9% of the general population who having experienced a trauma will go on to develop PTSD. And now let me show you the results for those people who reported a trauma that was not considered valid for DSM-5. So a trauma like that bus stop example. And you can see some of the other examples here, experience of own mental ill health, um, uh, things that happen at school, including um, bullying, is a very dominant one, bereavement as well. And very sadly, interaction with health services was also something that some people talked about. 
So 86% of autistic men and 53% of the autistic females reported one of these non-traditional, non-DSM traumas. And 43% of these trauma-exposed autistic adults reported current symptoms passing the threshold on that PTSD questionnaire. You remember the previous figure was 45%, now we have 43%, really no difference. So regardless of the type of traumatic experience, if you experience it as traumatic, as an autistic person, you're at a high risk of developing PTSD symptoms. And uh, Dr. Anika Kumar uh, has done a qualitative piece of research around this, asking 12 adults with PTSD symptomatology and exposure to a traumatic life event about their experience and about what helped and what didn't help. And she used thematic analysis and she found, among other things, that many autistic adults reported multiple traumatic life events and complex PTSD. She suggests that routine screening of trauma exposure and PTSD symptoms is needed, but very rare in services for autistic people. And we think this is just as relevant for children in schools, teenagers in college and adults in the community. Um, access to evidence-based and autism adaptive psychological therapies is needed. So let me just mention the impact of poor mental health on people on the autism spectrum. So this is work not by my group, but work that to sum it up shows that autistic traits in a group of university students is associated with poor quality of life, but that is mediated through depression and anxiety and loneliness and social anxiety. So being autistic or having a high autistic traits need not lead to poor quality of life. When it does so, it's because autism is associated with becoming depressed and socially anxious, for example. Another fact that we've become aware of recently is that the rates of suicide are sadly very high among autistic people. So you can see here some um, information from Lisa Corwin's study where she looked at medical health insurance records for autistic adults in America. Um, and also in Scandinavia, they've also found an odds ratio over seven. So autistic people seven times more likely to, um, to commit suicide or to attempt suicide. And that's especially true for women and those without intellectual disability. So why the very high rates of mental health problems in children and adults uh, on the autism spectrum? Well, of course, there may well be some genetic links, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, I'm not a geneticist, but there are some suggestions of genetic links. But let's think about the other possibilities. Firstly, environmental factors and adverse life events. So this is a study, data from a study that um, Gavin Stewart has completed and, and written up and published. And we used an online sample of adults age 50 and above. It's called the PROTECT study. And we asked them about their autistic traits. So we could split them into high autistic traits. They're shown here in red and controls who have no autistic traits or low autistic traits in blue. And you can see here the rates of self-report of physical neglect, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, and emotional neglect. Um, and really very sad findings that these are not people who are diagnosed autistic. Um, they're a generation where many will be underdiagnosed or undiagnosed, but those who report high autistic traits also report higher levels of these adverse life experiences. They also report uh, more PTSD symptoms. That's what's shown in this graph. Again, the uh, red are the autistic, high autistic trait people. We split them here into those who had low or high childhood adversity, where they reported that they did have or they didn't have those negative life events in childhood. And you can see a, an interaction where if you have high autistic traits, having um, childhood adversity is even worse for you than if you don't have autistic traits. It's not good for anyone, but it's even worse. So those are some environmental factors. What about living as an autistic person, the autistic way of processing the world? Is that playing into mental health problems? So some hypotheses might include that communication difficulties in autism might mean that autistic children and adults are less able to seek help and that that has an effect on their mental health. Social difficulties may lead to social isolation. And we know that loneliness is bad for everybody's mental health. 
social difficulties may lead to traumatic experiences, to social um, conflict, which again is bad for mental health. And preference for sameness, which is people finding change very stressful, may also affect mental health because you can't stop change from happening. Some of the cognitive characteristics of autism include difficulty knowing what other people are thinking and sometimes knowing what you yourself are thinking. And that may make it difficult to request help. Detail focus may play into that fear of change and sensory sensitivities can make the world very stressful. And executive dysfunction, difficulty planning ahead makes novelty stressful. This is just a, um, one example of some of a study that we've done looking at some characteristics that go along with autism, even though they're not part of autism themselves. And these include alexithymia, which is difficulty reflecting on and talking about your own emotions, and intolerance or uncertainty, which is having a very negative response to not being certain about what's going to happen next. And in this sample of children um, with neurodevelopmental difficulties and autism, we found that alexithymia had a strong effect on intolerance, uncertainty, and that in turn affected anxiety and depression. And the last thing I want to think about, and this is going to bring us to autistic women and girls, is the effect on, on mental health of camouflaging, masking, and compensating. So, Camouflaging is something that autistic people themselves have told us about. So here's a, a quote from an autistic person from Twitter. They said, I remember the decision to put on the mask the summer before I started at a new school. I was tired of being bullied. I studied movies to learn how to be a cool kid. And a lot of autistic people will tell us that in order to fit in or to avoid being bullied, they will attempt to look less autistic and to appear more neurotypical or non-autistic. And one autistic um, woman I know said that when she was a child, she chose a girl in her class who was socially successful and she copied everything about her, how she dressed, how she talked, how she walked, what she talked about, how she did her hair. And that was her way of trying to blend in. There's been the suggestion that social expectations are different by gender in most cultures and that there may be more pressure on females on the autism spectrum to modify their behavior to look more normal. Um, so autistic adults describe masking or camouflaging as exhausting and also as eroding their sense of self. So I think I'll skip that for time, but qualitative work by Lucy Livingston looked at uh, what autistic people themselves said about compensating and camouflaging. And I'm going to zoom in on one part of this. So um, autistic people describe um, co compensating and camouflaging as, uh, as hard work and also as eroding their authentic self. So here's a quote. I feel like I'm acting most of the time. And when people say that I have a characteristic, I feel like a fraud because I've made that characteristic appear. And an autistic girl that I was talking to about her mental health difficulties, but also she was telling me about how her friends were really supportive. She then said, but it's not me that they're friends with. It's the mask that I wear. And so all of that affection wasn't reaching her because she felt that she couldn't be herself. We've done a, a study on camouflaging and autistic traits. This was a study in the general population of young people and we used the Camouflaging of Autistic Traits Questionnaire, the CAPQ, which asks questions like, um, uh, how much do you agree with the following statement? When I'm interacting with someone, I deliberately copy their body language or facial expressions. So if you strongly agree with that, you would get a higher score for attempting to camouflage. And what we found was that both males and females um, in this general population sample reported varying levels of camouflaging and it, for both um, sexes or genders, camouflaging was positively correlated with self-report of autistic traits. So if you report more autistic traits, you also report more camouflaging, which makes sense. But sadly, how much camouflaging you do was negatively correlated with your quality of life, your self-reported quality of life. 
So the more camouflaging you do, the less good you rate your quality of life. And of course, we can't judge direction of causation, but it's an important thing to consider. Camouflaging can also be problematic for diagnosis. So uh, here a quote from Lucy's study, uh, I did well on the IQ test and kept my head down. And other autistic people will say, uh, in the, the 30 minutes, 40 minutes that I spend with the doctor, him deciding if I'm autistic, I will be camouflaging because that's my habit. He won't see what I'm really like. And we know that diagnosis is a vital signpost to understanding. So here are some quotes from parents. Jane, whose son Dan was diagnosed at age 15 after eight years of trying to seek a diagnosis. And she said, the diagnostic delay led to severe mental health issues for him, which cut him off from school and his peers. It also had a hugely negative impact on our family life. And uh, Helen, who was told something wasn't quite right when her, her son was three, but he didn't receive a diagnosis of autism until he was 26. She said, had we had a diagnosis a lot sooner, then we could have avoided the hideous condition of depression and all the misery and pain that entails. So diagnosis is important and camouflaging may also delay diagnosis. So let me turn to a group that we think are underdiagnosed, underrecognized presently, and that's uh, girls and women on the autism spectrum. The traditional view, maybe um, five years ago or even more recently, was that there were perhaps five times as many men and males as females on the autism spectrum. And when people used to talk about Asperger's syndrome, sometimes they quoted a figure of 10 times as many males as females. And the view was that fewer women and girls were autistic, but when they were autistic, they were more likely to also have intellectual disability. But all of these estimates tended to be from individuals known to diagnostic services. There were clinic registers or special educational needs registers from schools. The recent findings are that the male to female ratio of diagnosed uh, autism is more like three to one. And that the ratio is similar across the range of intellectual disability and intellectual ability. These now estimates are taken from epidemiological studies where people don't just look at who managed to get a diagnosis, but go into the population and see who would receive a diagnosis um, if they were, if you assessed their autistic traits. And so putting these figures together, I think we can uh, infer that the difference between the numbers of women known to clinical services and the numbers who are out there in epidemiological studies, that there is underdiagnosis of autistic girls and women. What evidence do we have of that? Well, we know from research that at similar levels of symptoms, females are less likely to be diagnosed than males. Females are identified on average later than males with autism. And girls who get diagnosed often have other red flags, other things like intellectual disability or behavior problems that bring them to clinical attention. And that's not true for boys. Why is autism less well recognized in females? Well, there are several reasons. The first, I think, is a knowledge gap. So most research historically involved mostly male participants, boys and men. And some studies only involved boys and men. Um, so one meta-analysis of neuroimaging studies found eight times more males than female participants. Um, and going back historically, I think you'd find even higher discrepancy. So when we say we know something about autism from research, we often know about something from male biased data. And why does that matter? Because the research feeds into the diagnostic criteria. And so we don't know whether our diagnostic assessments and criteria are really fair to autistic girls and women. Other reasons why autism may be less well recognized in females include the uh, issue about compensation and camouflaging that I've mentioned. Um, and of course, autistic males camouflage, uh, may camouflage as well. All of these differences are only on average. You can have an autistic man who presents in the more atypical way that we might associate with autistic females. And you can have an autistic female who presents in the very classical uh, camera type uh, tradition that we're used to seeing. Uh, another reason for underdiagnosis in females is that some of the symptoms of autism may present a little differently in some girls, not in all. 
So some females may show their social difficulties as being very clingy. They really cling on to one girl at school who must be their friend, rather than the more aloof style that maybe is the stereotype of autism. The intense interests that are part of the autistic phenotype may not be as unusual in, in terms of focus, although they are still unusual in terms of intensity. So if a clinician asks a 15 year old boy uh, who's he's assessing for autism, what are you interested in? And the 15 year old boy says, electricity pylons. Let me show you all my photographs of electricity pylons. The clinician may think, hmm, that's unusual, could be autism. But if the clinician asks a 15 year old girl and she says, oh, I'm interested in this particular band or this particular actor or this particular uh, breed of horse, the clinician may think, well, lots of girls are interested in those things. But if the clinician digged a bit further, they find that actually they just collect information about the actor. They don't want to see them perform or they just collect uh, facts about very particular species of horse and they have no interest in other, any other type of horse at all. So the intensity and focus is unusual. Another reason why autism may be less well recognized in females is that we all carry a male bias stereotype of autism in our heads. Clinicians, teachers, and parents, when they see a socially awkward boy, they may think, is that autism? When they see a socially awkward girl, they're more likely to think, is that social anxiety? Is she just shy? So we don't have a, a, a gender neutral idea about autism. And uh, perhaps lastly, there is diagnostic overshadowing in part because of that bias. So if we know from um, the anorexia clinics at the Maudsley Hospital that around 20 to 30 percent of women who come to hospital for anorexia actually meet diagnostic criteria for autism if they're assessed for autism. And that's not just because of low current body weight, which we know does affect cognition. Um, it's also persisting when those patients get better from the anorexia. So a clinician may see the anorexia, but not see past the anorexia to the autism as well, because anorexia is a female typical condition, but autism isn't. But it's really important that they do dig deeper and don't let one diagno diagnosis hide the other one, because the drivers of anorexia in autism may be very different in some cases and need different types of treatment approaches. So this is um, some work in progress. Uh, again, with our twin sample. So um, this is just illustrating that the age of diagnosis in this sample, who are currently 22 years old, um, that the males were diagnosed significantly younger than the females. And I want to show you the correlations with age of diagnosis. Does it matter at what age you get diagnosed? But let me show you our work in progress. So we find that for females, but not males, Age of diagnosis is correlated with IQ. If you have a higher IQ, you get diagnosed later if you're female, but not if you're a man. We find that age of diagnosis is correlated with camouflaging, that cat Q questionnaire about how much you try to camouflage. If, um, if you camouflage a lot, that's correlated with a later age of diagnosis if you're a female, but not if you're a male. But note that quality of life self-reported psychological quality of life is negatively related to age of diagnosis. Later age of diagnosis is related to lower self-reported quality of life. So age of diagnosis matters. And turning more to, uh, to school, this is a slide from the National Autistic Society in the UK, making the point that uh, a lot of girls are undiagnosed. And so they're in mainstream schools, not getting any support. And girls who have a diagnosis are often in specialist schools, which have a huge preponderance of male pupils. So this little girl, autistic girl, is saying, I want to go to another school because this is a boys' school. And another quote, some, an adult saying about their school days, no matter which school I went to, I would either feel frustrated by the chaotic mainstream world or suffocated by special schooling. So we've been attempting to raise awareness of autism in girls and women. And uh, there's a free booklet you can download from the NASEN website, Girls and Autism Flying Under the Radar. 
and uh, a book that uh, Barry Carpenter and Joe Egerton and myself edited with all these wonderful contributors, um, parents and teachers and autistic women themselves. So autism can be seen as a problem of translation between the autistic mind and the neurotypical mind, the non-autistic mind. So because our minds are different, there can be misunderstanding and confusion and frustration. Unfortunately, there's victimization and vulnerability and stress, but these are all things we can improve by understanding autism better. And part of that is about diagnosing autism and supporting autism. So I want to finish by just mentioning some really interesting work that uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rebecca Wood, um, has been doing, which is, I think, really essential to your webinar theme of inclusive education. When we think of inclusive education, we think about schools that welcome all types of pupils. But we also need to think about schools that welcome every type of teacher. So Rebecca has been doing a project specifically about autistic school staff adults who work in schools who are themselves autistic. And uh, she has a wonderful website that you can go to and you can watch a webinar that she had. There's a free resource on the Jessica Kingsley Press website, Amazing Autistic Teachers. And uh, Rebecca has these two books that I highly recommend. The Learning from Autistic Teachers has chapters by autistic teachers and head teachers who write about their experience, what they bring to teaching that makes them a really good teacher and what things in the school can make it really hard for them to be the best teacher they can be. So in conclusion, additional mental health problems are really common in children and adults on the autism spectrum. We think that post-traumatic stress disorder may be a really important and under-researched, under-recognized issue. The impact of mental health on quality of life is huge many, many studies showing that depression is the biggest determinant of, of poor quality of life for autistic people, far above the level of autistic symptoms themselves. And mental health problems are often overlooked, yet many are highly treatable. And there's a lot of work going on adapting cognitive behavior therapy and other treatments for autistic people uh, to treat the anxiety and depression and so on. When we think about camouflaging, we have to be aware that a, a, school child, autistic school child, who we say is doing well because they don't look very autistic, they may be suffering. They, that masking may come at quite a high cost to them. And I think this makes us maybe think again about how we approach things like social skills interventions. We don't want to be telling autistic people that they are broken and that they have to do things differently. Autistic girls, I think, are still flying under the radar and being missed and underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. So future research is needed to establish the causes, maintaining factors and best treatments for mental Ill health on the autism spectrum and diagnosing people, both the autism and the additional difficulties are an essential first step. So I'd like to thank all our research volunteers uh, who made this work possible, and our autistic consultants who advise us on our research studies, all of my colleagues uh, and our funders, and particularly you for listening, uh, and you can see the uh, new book, Autism, uh, that Demetrius is translating into Greek, and I'm very glad that he's doing that. Um, and these are some of the wonderful uh, lab members who contributed to our work. So I will finish there and come back to... Um, okay, Professor, can... Professor Francesca Hape, uh, thank you so much for your indeed very uh, interesting and uh, well-structured research-based speech in autism concerning particularly mental health needs and the socializing pro uh, problem of uh, under-recognition in girls in this field. Indeed, we found your speech, uh, including your conclusions, uh, extremely important and useful for both uh, uh, research and school practices. Uh, multiple mental health problems in children and adults with uh, 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 autism spectrum disorder, particularly in the uh, 12 to 14 uh, years, the autistic masking as a social survival strategy, the need for diagnosis of uh, autism in the appropriate age of individuals, the problem of under-recognition in girls 
the role of the Tunday uh, inclusive school in caring and providing appropriate education uh, for children with autism, as well as the wonderful awareness, do not forget the teachers. Uh, we read in a slide uh, of your presentation, all of them are important topics for discussion between uh, uh, yourself, the speaker, and the audience. Uh, I can't see any question uh, except for the last one, one only, and also I have some personal questions for uh, answer. Uh, autistic children, uh, both and girls, are being uh, bullied in regular schools and we still insist uh, on inclusion. This is a question, is a question. Uh, by yeah. a member of the audience. Yes. Well, I think um, it's certainly true that autistic children experience a lot of bullying, autistic adults as well. The solution is clearly to, to eradicate the bullying. Um, there shouldn't be bullying in school of anybody for any reason. Um, and if an autistic pupil wants to access mainstream school, then bullying should certainly not be a reason why they can't. It is the case in this country that as a result of the pandemic and schools being shut, quite a lot of parents of autistic children, if they can, are choosing to homeschool because they found that their children were much less stressed during the pandemic when they were doing their schoolwork mm -hmm. remotely from home, partly because the sensory environment is less overwhelming and partly for reasons like bullying or you know, being uh, not accepted for who they are at school. So um, I am seeing that trend happening. And of course, that's a, that's a great deal of strain and a, a huge amount to ask from parents. Um, but I hope that we will learn something more about making schools more accommodating to autistic pupils um, because we know we can teach pupils remotely, mm -hmm. and for some pupils that might be that might be a, a good thing at least at certain periods of their lives. But clearly, the issue is to stamp out the bullying rather than send a child to a different school because no school should have bullying. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me ask some personal questions. Um, uh, what about the key word of uh, neuron diversity in autism? Can you explain in more words? What do you mean? And uh, what's the relation with the everyday life? The concept of neurodiversity was that. Yes. Um, yes, the concept. The concept. So neurodiversity um, was a term coined with uh, a parallel to ecological diversities or biodiversity. So we know that our world contains all kinds of species. Um, and by parallel, we wouldn't say that you know a cat is a less good species than a fish. They're good at different things. Um, so the parallel is that uh, we recognize in the neurodiversity concept that people have different minds, neuro, different brains, different minds, and that instead of thinking of them as better or worse, we should think of them as different. And that this is part of the rich variety of the natural world, in this case, the natural world inside our heads. So. A lot of autistic people have embraced this notion of neurodiversity, which of course includes not only autism, but other ways that uh, somebody's way of thinking can be different from the average um, or the neurotypical. Um, so uh, I'm dyslexic and that would be considered a neurodivergent uh, cognitive uh, style because my brain processes sounds and sounds and writing in ways that are different from the average person. Uh, somebody who has ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, would also be considered neurodivergent and many other possibilities too. And so this idea of neurodiversity is part of really a, a social justice movement of respecting those differences. So autistic people, for example, uh, autistic self-advocates would argue that to talk about curing autism is as inappropriate as it was when uh, psychiatrists, maybe in the 1920s, used to talk about curing homosexuality. It's not a deficit or a disease to be cured. These are differences among human beings that should be respected. So that's the, broadly speaking, the notion of neurodiversity and neurodivergent conditions are different from neurotypical. But mm -hmm. it, we sometimes people have difficulty with that notion alongside recognizing that autism is 
disabling when we ask, ask autistic people to live in a world designed for neurotypical people. So to talk about neurodiversity is not to deny that many autistic people have significant disabilities. And of course, if you also have intellectual disability or um, a, a language disability, then those things make life really very, very difficult um, in, in our world and with the demands of, of everyday life. I hope that makes sense, Demetrius. Okay, thank you very much for your very extended explanation of this uh, term. Uh, in your new book, I translated uh, into Greek, uh, you have a, a unit uh, by the title The Constellation and uh, Autisms, mm -hmm. uh, in plural, Autisms, not Autism, Autism. Can you explain? Because uh, it's a little bit difficult uh, to translate into Greek uh, this uh, word in English. Yes. So the autisms, with an S on the end, the plural, mm -hmm. um, is reflecting that current biological science suggests that there are many different causes or etiologies underlying autism in different people. So some people consider that the, the whole range, what we call the spectrum, autistic spectrum is so varied that it's actually made up of many different uh, set, different causes so that one person's autism may be caused by a rare genetic mutation and another person's autism might be caused by um, ordinary genetic variation, lots of common alleles, just like the, the way that our height is determined by many, mm -hmm. many genes. So that's why they talk about the autisms and many biologists think that we will only make progress when we can divide up people in, by their biological cause. So that's one thing. The constellation is a way of rethinking what we often talk about as the spectrum. So Lorna Wing introduced the notion of the autism spectrum to reflect that there are, is a wide range of manifestations of the core features of social and, commu commu social and communication difficulties and rigid and repetitive behavior. But when we think of a spectrum, we often think about something along one dimension, a spectrum of light lines up all the colors along one dimension. But we think of autism more as a constellation because we know from our research that how severe your social and communication difficulties are is not very correlated with how severe your rigid and repetitive behavior is. So we need to plot those across two dimensions at least. And then we should add in other aspects like sensory sensitivities, or level of intellectual disability or language disability. And so we have a space defined by multiple um, axes, if you imagine the sort of graph, and people can be anywhere in this space. You might have one person in this part of the constellation who has a, a lot of social communication difficulty, but isn't very rigid and repetitive, for example, and somebody in another part of the space who is very rigid, but whose social communication difficulties are less severe. So I hope that sort of makes sense of why we like to talk about a constellation rather than a single okay. dimensional spectrum. Anyhow, do you think that this is a new uh, term? We can use uh, this term instead of uh, uh, autism uh, spectrum? Maybe eventually, maybe eventually people like mm -hmm. the autism spectrum. And of course, we people often use the rainbow uh, mm -hmm. you know, as part of the symbols for, for autism. But I, I think constellation would be better. So maybe it will catch on. Okay, thank you. Uh, you sent me your introduction with uh, Sue Fletcher for the Greek edition. Uh, you ended your text by uh, referring to a phrase uh, attributed to Plato sometimes, and uh, this is uh, be kind. For everyone you meet is uh, fighting a hard battle. Uh, can you explain in more words and what do you think by uh, be kind? Because uh, this is a philosophical uh, term and also a social term. Yes. So I mean it in a very simple sense that 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 you know, kindness uh, is is uh, a real virtue and it's something that autistic people receive too little of. We know from research that non-autistic people tend to make negative first impressions of autistic people, um, but that can be improved if the non-autistic person knows that they're meeting an autistic person and if the non-autistic person knows more about autism. So 
the mm. point of that quote was to say that we don't know the battles that people are fighting. We often don't know that somebody's autistic. Mm -hmm. And if you think about being in a supermarket, there might be a mother there with a child who is eight or nine, who is on the floor having a tantrum. And you might th your first reaction might be, what a bad parent. Why aren't they controlling their child? But you don't know that the battles that they're fighting. So this might mm -hmm. be a child who's autistic, who's just completely stressed out, who's finding that the flashing fluorescent lights on, in the supermarket are making them just overwhelmed. So this is a parent doing their best with a child who's doing their best, but living a very different life from the life that maybe we lead or that we expect most children to be leading. So it's really just a call for compassion and understanding um, because people are fighting hard battles and often the battle in autism is invisible um, as we've also talked about in terms of camouflaging. Okay, do you think that uh, this term uh, is, uh, uh, this word is related to sympathy, to empathy? Um, uh, yes, well, I think that, that kindness can, can be enhanced by being empathic, yes, and being able mm -hmm. to, to feel with somebody else. But even if we find somebody who's in a situation we can't, we haven't ever been in, mm -hmm. we can still be kind, I think. So if somebody loses, you know, if, if somebody's child dies, you might say, you know, I can't imagine what you're going through, but I feel for you, you know, I care and I would want to help you. So even when we can't put ourselves into somebody else's shoes um, and have that deep empathy, we can still have caring, I think. And it's important to note that, of course, empathy is not deficient in autistic people. Although autistic people may find it difficult to know what you're thinking, they care what you're feeling. And many autistic people are extremely empathic. So I don't agree with some ways that people talk about autism as a, a disorder of empathy. I don't think that's right. We need to separate yeah. out caring for people and feeling with people's emotions. In, and on the other hand, knowing what somebody's thinking. And if we think about uh, somebody who is a psychopath, a sociopath, they very often have very good theory of mind. They know exactly what you're thinking and they will deceive you and trick you because they can read your mind, but they don't care at all what you're feeling. They don't feel for you mm -hmm. or feel with you if you're suffering. In fact, they may enjoy it. An autistic person typically is the opposite. They may not know exactly what you're thinking and they may not be able to tell a white lie to, to save face, but they care how you're feeling and they care about people who are in disaster zones, people who are hungry, people who are in pain. And I think it's really important to note that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, two questions from the audience and also uh, a, a member of the audience. Uh, thank you so much for such an uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. That's for you. Uh, a question. Have studies shown any correlation between uh, autism and dyslexia or attention deficit disorder? It's a very good question. And thank you for sending in your questions. It's nice for me to learn from you and what you're interested in. So um, yes, there is a large overlap between um, autism and ADHD. Um, that's definitely proven in, in both directions. So among ADHD uh, people, um, a higher proportion than the general population will also be autistic. And among autistic people, a higher proportion will have ADHD. But of course, you can have them separately. And I think the suspicion is that there's maybe some genetic connection. But also, of course, if you have ADHD, your mm -hmm. autism will be more obvious. If you find it difficult to, to um, dampen down and control your behavior, your autism may be more obvious. But interestingly, in ADHD, we see the same thing as in autism, that women and girls are underdiagnosed. Women and girls with ADHD more often have the inattentive subtype. They're not so hyperactive. So they're not noticed, they're not causing disruption in school, but they are suffering in school because they're not keeping up because their mind is wandering. And of course, that's very negative for them because they feel they're stupid or um, they feel they're told that they're lazy when actually they have an attention problem that could be diagnosed and could be treated either with psychological approaches or with medication if they want that. So um, that's very important. Um, the dyslexia and autism link is less well explored, but I think there are higher rates of dyslexia among autistic people. 
I'm not mm-hmm. sure that it's true the other way around that there are high rates of autism among dyslexic people. Okay. Um, but uh, but I can <laughs> go away and find out. Okay. Do you mean that we need more research on this topic? Yes, I think this, so. This uh, oh. sort of relation. Yes, and also okay. we we should be aware of that diagnostic overshadowing. So we know that for ADHD, um, sometimes a, woman, a girl with ADHD will be diagnosed with um, with anxiety or with um, depression uh, mm-hmm. or, or with dyslexia, but their ADHD is overlooked, um, just like I described the anorexia leading to the autism being overlooked. So yes, we need more research and more awareness. Uh, do you think that the, the right uh, hemisphere is uh, related to uh, to dyslexia and to autism? Um, I think the, the function probably, of the right hem- yes. hemisphere. I think that's probably would be too, a little bit too simple. Um, I mm-hmm. think that the, the we don't understand the brain in autism for mm-hmm. sure, but it does seem to be to do with long range connections and um, inhibitory excitatory imbalance. But we don't. There isn't conclusive evidence in dyslexia. I think it's a bit better. The brain imaging studies have gone a bit further, mm-hmm. and I think they're showing that different parts of the language system are not connecting up as much as much or as they should. Um, but of course, it's also very dependent on which language you're you're learning to to read and spell in. And in regular orthographies uh, like Italian, it's much easier to to get by as a dyslexic. In English, it's terrible because the orthography is so irregular. I don't know enough about Greek, I'm afraid, to, mm. to talk about that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a last question before closing. Uh, what do you mean by autistic uh, burnout? You, you, you referred yes. to this yes. Uh, point. Yes, so this is, this is um, an area that autistic people are talking about, but there is hardly any research yet. I think there are two published papers. But I have a PhD student who's exploring this area. She's uh, um, you know, interested herself in that experience. So burnout um, in general is not a diagnosis, but it's, a, it's used in occupational um, psychology to describe a state where somebody is um, exhausted and um, loses motivation over their work and often uh, feels generally fatigued and emotionally drained. Um, mm-hmm. But autistic people often describe outside of work context that just life can can wear them out in that way. So whereas often people talk about burnout for seeing nurses or doctors, that their jobs just become too much for them. Autistic mm-hmm. people are saying life and social interaction can become mm-hmm. too much. So they burn out, they become very fatigued, they can't go to work, they can't go out um, and their brains start not working as well. They feel sort of mental fog. Um, so we don't really have a good definition of this yet. We don't really understand how much it's related to, say, depression. Um, but it certainly seems to relate to what autistic people and parents of autistic children will talk about. They talk about meltdowns, which is where you have a sort of explosive, angry or violent reaction to not being able to cope with demands exceeding capacity. And then shutdowns, where you maybe even lose the ability to talk temporarily and sometimes lose movement. So you feel like you can't voluntarily move or you move very slowly uh, and this fatigue and this kind of longer term burnout experience. So it's a, it's a work in progress, but it's being talked about in the autism community and we're keen to do some research and try and find out more and find out how to prevent it and what helps once you get into a burnt out state, what helps you to come back to, to good functioning. Okay, thank you very much for the time you spend Uh, for your presentation and uh, the explanations uh, and answers uh, to our question. Uh, We uh, thank very much, we uh, we would like to thank you very much for your uh, contribution to the success of the webinar uh, speakers uh, series of uh, the Department of Educational Studies. And we hope that uh, we will uh, hear you Uh, in uh, uh, the future with uh, some uh, similar or other topic. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, my uh, thinking is that uh, a lot of uh, points of your presentation could be transformed into uh, school practice. Mm -hmm. 
we shall try to do that. That would be wonderful. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you, for thank you very me. much for everything and uh, have you a nice uh, evening and a nice time afterwards. Thank you, thank you very much. Goodbye thank you very much. much.